Dead America, Ground Zero, Dead America Box Sets Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day Zero, 7.30 a.m. Brandon Shelton leaned over the stove, giving the egg mixture a good scrambling before leaving it to set into a fluffy omelette. He sprinkled cheese and spinach over it, and then glanced over at Samantha, waiting patiently at the kitchen island. He shot her a goofy grin, and she couldn't help but laugh at his infectious expression. You sure you don't want some ham or sausage in here? he asked. She wrinkled her nose. No, Daddy, eating animals is wrong. Ten years old and already a vegetarian. He turned back to the pan and muttered to himself, We'll see what happens when you're old enough to appreciate a properly prepared steak. Melissa bounced into the kitchen in her yoga outfit, chocolate ponytail bouncing along behind her. Brandon drew his bottom lip between his teeth as he took a moment to admire his wife's tight body while she leaned over to grab the orange juice. Mummy, Daddy wants me to eat animals, Samantha whined. Melissa chuckled as she poured herself a glass of juice. And why would he do such a thing? she asked playfully. Because I don't want my little girl getting teased at school, he replied. This is Texas. Some things are sacred. His wife rolled her eyes. We also live in the liberal Alamo that is Austin, she kissed the top of her daughter's head. She'll be fine, she winked at Brandon. Besides, that just means more steak for us. He chuckled and flipped the omelette, enjoying the hiss of the heat firing up on the egg. My yoga class should be over by ten, so if you and Samantha want to meet me at the restaurant by eleven, we can have lunch together, Melissa said as she filled up her water bottle. Brandon nodded. Sounds like a date. We should be finished with a checkup by then. He slid the finished omelette onto a plate and set it down in front of Samantha with a flourish, just as his pager trilled its intrusive ring. He frowned as he crossed the kitchen to the device on the counter. Come on, Captain, this is the first day off I've had in a week, he groaned. They're not calling you in, are they? Melissa's brow furrowed, disappointment evident in her voice. He shook his head. The digital readout simply said, All hands on deck. I'm sorry, baby, I've got to go. His wife pursed her lips as Samantha let out a little whine of disapproval. If they're calling you in on your day off, it must be bad, Melissa said, putting a supportive hand on her daughter's shoulder. I'll take care of Samantha. You go play the hero. Brandon approached them and pulled them both into a tight hug. Don't worry, I'm sure it's nothing major, he said as he pulled back, noting the look of worry on his wife's face. When I was leaving last night, there were a few call-outs, so this is probably nothing more than them needing another warm body on standby. He focused his expression into a reassuring facade. But beneath his exterior, his heart pounded in his chest. In all his years on SWAT, there was only one other all-hands-on-deck moment, and it had been a maniac with an AK-47 laying waste to an office building. Whatever was going on wasn't going to make for a pleasant day. He gave Melissa a kiss, and then leaned down to kiss the top of Samantha's head. You were supposed to take me to my doctor's appointment, she pouted. Brandon offered her a big smile. Mommy's going to take you, but I'll try to be there for lunch to make it up to you. Make it up to me? She gave him a sly grin. So you won't eat meat either? He winced as his wife barked a laugh. Okay, honey, no meat at lunch, he promised. Yay, thanks, Daddy! Samantha cried and threw her arms around his neck. He hugged her and then set her back in her seat. Okay, finish your breakfast so you can get going to your appointment. He stood up and ruffled her hair. Melissa put a gentle hand on his arm. Be careful. He gave her another sweet kiss. Always. Chapter 2 7.55 a.m. Brandon hustled through the police station. It was in chaos. People rushing about everywhere, barking orders at each other. But it was only half as full as it should have been at that time of day. As he entered the SWAT staging area, three of his co-workers were already there, gearing up. Well, it's about goddamn time you got here, Blanchard said gruffly. We were thinking we'd have to leave without you. Brandon rolled his eyes. 
I'm pretty sure there's a regulation against going into a hostile situation without the best trooper in the unit. Well, let's hope not, because I don't think Skidmore is making it in. Blanchard shot back, his salt and pepper beard glimmering in the fluorescence as he grinned. There were laughs all around as they finished gearing up. Brandon shrugged into his vest and slung on his tactical assault rifle. When the hell happened to Skidmore anyway? Dalton asked. He was the youngest of the quartet in his mid-twenties, but with his tall frame dwarfing the rest of them, nobody would guess that right away. Dudley shrugged from behind him, sliding his hat over his bald head. Probably the same thing that happened to the rest of our team. Out sick with that stomach bug or whatever the hell it is. So do y'all have any idea why we're in here on our day off? Brandon asked as he finished dressing. Blanchard shook his head. Probably Alpha Team shitting themselves at the sight of a single loser with a handgun. They gotta call in the real badasses to bail them out. I really wish that was the case, Blanchard, Captain Schultz declared from the doorway. The four SWAT officers turned to their captain as he entered the room, face pale and somber. That was never a good sign, and Brandon's stomach plummeted into his boots. Don't mind me, Schultz said, waving them off. Y'all finish getting suited up. Y'all have places to be. What gives, Captain? Dudley asked as he laced up his boot. Why are we here on our day off? Schultz took a deep breath. Around 6.45 this morning, we got a call from a UT campus officer saying there was a major disturbance at the student medical center. He began. Now normally, we would have just dispatched a couple of uniforms over there to check it out. But it so happens that the campus officer in question was one of my old partners from way back in the day. He said they needed the SWAT team and I could hear that something wasn't right in his voice, so I complied. We heard nothing from then until this call came in to 911 at 725. He pulled out his cell phone and hit play on the recording. 911, what is your image? Oh my god, send help! Send help! Brandon froze at the sound of utter fear in the man's voice. It was the embodiment of intense desperation, the sound of a man that had seen something horrendous. Sir, I need you to calm down. What is your name and where are you? I'm with SWAT. We need every available officer at the- The sound of gunshots erupted his yelling, and there were screams in the background. Sir, is everything okay? They're fucking everywhere! Where are you, sir? UT Student Medical Center. Send everyone! There were more gunshots, more screaming. Die, motherfucker, die! Die! There was a clatter that sounded like the phone had been dropped, and then a very close scream of utter agony. Brandon let out a ragged breath that he hadn't been aware he was holding. His fists clenched and shook. The captain turned off the recording. There are a few more shots and screams before the line goes dead. We've tried every form of communication we can think of, but to no avail. None of the SWAT team members are responding, and phone service in the area is out of commission. The faces of the team were greenish-white, eyes wide. Brandon pursed his lips. Rewind it a bit, Captain, he asked. What the hell would you want to hear it again for? Dudley blurted. Brandon held up a hand. Just please. Schultz pulled the recording back a bit, and they listened carefully as the last few shots rang out. Brandon nodded. There. There? What do you mean, there? Dudley threw up his hands. His co-worker held up a finger. If you listen closely, you can hear that every single shot is coming from our man. That means that whatever is in there didn't take him down with a weapon, or at least not with a gun. Who the fuck would do that? Dalton put in, raising his rifle. When you got one of these bad boys staring down range at you, you're taking cover, not rushing into the bullets. I know one way we can find out. Blanchard stepped forward. Get your shit and let's go. There's a geared up SUV waiting for you in the garage. Schultz told them. Get up to campus, find out what's going on, and report back any way you can. There was a chorus of, yes, sir, as they headed out towards the garage, determined but terrified. Chapter 3. 8.30 a.m. Fucking Austin traffic, man, Dalton lamented as he drove the SUV through downtown. We're three miles away from campus and it still takes twenty damn minutes to get there. Dudley nodded. Well, pretty sure we could have walked it faster than this. 
Yeah, but then we would have had to put old Blanchard here down like an injured horse when his knees disintegrated from all that activity. Brandon joked from the passenger seat. Blanchard punched the back of his co-worker's headrest. Bitch, I ran a 10K last month. When's the last time you walked further than the distance between your couch and your car? I know. I could live to be a hundred and never understand the appeal of paying someone for the privilege of running long distances. Brandon shook his head. Fuck you, man, the older man shot back. It was a fundraiser. Dudley raised an eyebrow. Oh, yeah? For what? Hell if I know, Blanchard shrugged. It was one of them child-killing diseases or something. I just did it because I wanted the medal. Ladies go crazy for a man wearing one of those. Dalton snorted. I've seen the women you date, man. You could have gotten the same reaction with a sixer of high life and a couple of dollar scratcher tickets. The SUV erupted into laughter, even Blanchard joining in. They sped through a yellow light to get them into the front parking lot for the university campus. The lot was jam-packed with cars, but Dalton screeched to a stop at the far end in a pickup zone, and the four of them bustled out into the sunlight. A few students nearby eyed the four heavily armed SWAT officers on the sidewalk, a young couple carrying books brushing past them in confusion from the other side. Dalton shook his head. All right, when someone spots the dire emergency, can you let the rest of us know? Any idea where the student medical center is? Brandon asked, turning to his youngest co-worker. Dudley shrugged. Man, it's been years since I've been on this campus. No idea. Blanchard waved to the closest cluster of students holding their books and eyeing the men curiously. Yo, kids, he called. Got a question for you. Yes, officer? One of the girls replied, drawing her lower lip between her teeth. He smiled. Where's the student medical center? Up those stairs there. Then it's straight across on the other side of the quad, she said, and pointed behind them. You can't miss it. Blanchard winked at her. Appreciate it, ma'am. One more question, Brandon piped up, stepping forward. Did you all hear any big disturbances like an hour or two ago? The student shrugged before the girl replied. Not really. What do you mean, not really? Brandon's brow furrowed. What did you hear? Well, it sounded like someone was lighting off a bunch of firecrackers, she said, chewing her lip again. That went on for about twenty minutes or so, and then it just stopped. We're a few blocks away, so it didn't really bother us that much. Brandon nodded. All right, appreciate your time. The officers bustled up the stairs and onto the quad. The grass glimmered in the morning sun as if no horrors had ever touched it. Students hanging out under the golden glow with their books and headphones. Several multi-story buildings lined the area, with a large clock tower at the far end. It was like something out of a stock photo, and the officers were just as flabbergasted as they'd been when they first arrived. Man, everybody's gawking at us, Dudley said, amusement lacing his tone. This must be what it's like to be famous. Dalton barked a laugh. Oh, what it's like to leave the house without wearing pants. Nah, not like that, the young man replied. If that were the case, the ladies would be responding to me in an entirely different way. Well, they're currently not laughing their asses off, so you're probably right, Blanchard teased. Brandon reached the student medical center first, ignoring the trio of laughs happening behind him at Dudley's expense. He looked back and forth at how many students were coming in and out of the other buildings, but this door was completely void of activity. Man, this is bullshit, Dalton piped up. There ain't no emergency here. Blanchard groaned. I swear. If Alpha is playing a prank on us, I'm gonna whoop some wholesale ass. Ain't nobody gonna be spared. Brandon shook his head. Something isn't right, he declared. Look at all these other buildings. Everybody is going in and out like it's a normal day at the office. But the entire time we've been walking, nobody has even approached these doors from either side. All right, boys, Blanchard said, sobering. Let's get our serious face on. They clustered around the frosted glass. Dudley and Dalton stepping to either side as they get ready to throw them open. Brandon nodded to Blanchard. Count us down. His companion nodded and raised his weapon. Three, two, one. He took a deep breath. Go! Dalton and Dudley pulled hard on the doors, but they didn't budge. They relaxed their postures and each yanked again, but they were locked tight. Well, that was anticlimactic, Dudley muttered. Brandon frowned. Everybody try your radio for Alpha Team. 
The quartet fiddled with their radios, trying different frequencies to call out to the other team. There was no response on any channel. Brandon put his hands up against the frosted glass, but was unable to see even blurry shapes in the distance. Ideas? Dalton asked. Dudley tried to peer through the glass as well, and then sighed, taking a step back with a frown as he gave up. Fuck it, Blanchard snapped. I'm breaking the glass. Dudley put up a hand. But what if it's just a hoax? What if it's not? Brandon shot back, stepping away from the door. If it is, Blanchard replied as he pulled out his metal retractable baton, it'll be Alpha's fault, not ours. He raised his hand to bring it down on the door. Hey! A shrill voice froze the four of them, and they turned to see a blonde female student standing behind them, complete amazement in her gaze. What the hell are you doing? Door's locked, Blanchard replied with a shrug and wiggled his baton. I was about to use my key. She pulled a key ring from her pocket and jangled them up in front of the SWAT member. How about a set of real keys? Yeah, that's probably better, Dalton agreed, smacking his older companion's shoulder. Wouldn't want this old warhorse to tear his rotator cuff or something. What time does the medical center usually open? Dudley asked. The girl blinked at him in disbelief. It's a medical center? It's always open. Blanchard gave her a sardonic look and jiggled the handle of the door, showing that it was locked. You were saying, ma'am? Please spare me the ma'am, just Candace, she replied, though her voice was a bit absent as she stared at the door perplexed. Why is the door locked? She approached the doors and began to extend her key, but Brandon grabbed her wrist. Excuse me? she snapped, wrenching her arm from his grip. Who in the hell do you think you are? I'm Brandon Shelton of SWAT, he replied firmly, and held his hand out for the keys. You need to let me do this. Candice eyed him warily. Why? Because less than an hour ago, our other SWAT team made a frantic 911 call from in there, he explained calmly. It sounded like really bad things were going down. It'll be safer if you let me handle it. She pursed her lips and then gently placed the key ring in his hand. I'll need you to hang out here while we go in, okay? Brandon confirmed, and she nodded, taking a few steps back. He turned the key, and the deadbolt gave a dull thunk. The quartet resumed their original breaching position, weapons once again at the ready. Breach, take two, Blanchard said, raising his gun. Three, two, one, go! Dudley and Dalton yanked on the doors, and this time they opened, but only about six inches before there was a metallic clanging sound. Dudley gaped at the sight of chains holding the handle shut from the inside. Something is definitely not right here. Brandon stepped forward, pulling out his flashlight and shone it through the gap in the doors, peering into the darkness. There was scattered furniture, desks and chairs and papers on the floor, but no signs of life. Looks like there was a struggle of some kind, he murmured. Dalton swallowed hard. Must have been really fucking bad if they chained it up from the inside, he said. What were they trying to keep out? Better question is, what were they trying to keep in? Brandon replied, taking a step back. Blanchard raised his baton once again. Let's find out. The others got out of the way as he brought his hand down on the frosted glass door. The giant pane shattered easily, cascading to the ground in little shards. Blanchard slammed the baton end against the doorframe to retract it, and holstered it back up before raising his weapon once again. Eyes up! he barked. Let's go. He stepped through the doorframe, careful not to catch on the jagged glass still stuck in the edges of the metal. The other three ducked through behind him, and they fanned out in the small reception area. There was a long hallway in the center of the room leading straight back. The double doors that had once blocked it hung from their hinges, as if they'd been nearly torn in. Get a load of this, Dalton said from the left side, standing over a large pool of blood. Dudley pursed his lips as he approached. That's either from three separate people. Whoever that belonged to is long dead. But if they're dead, then where the hell did they go? Dalton wondered. Brandon walked to the reception window, sliding open the frosted glass to peer into a dimly lit office. It was more of the same. Blood splatters and overturned furniture. He shook his head and turned away. I think we can safely say this isn't a hoax, he declared. Blanchard raised his rifle as he stared straight down the hallway with the busted doors. I think I just saw something move, he said. The other three clustered around him, squinting in the low light. 
After a tense moment, they all jumped at the sound of crunching glass behind them. They whipped around, guns raised, and Candace froze, staring at them with wide eyes. Holy Jesus, girl, don't do that, Dudley breathed, lowering his weapon. Brandon pointed to the door she'd just ducked through. You need to wait outside, he said firmly. Oh my God, what happened? The blonde gasped, her hand rising to her chest at the sight of the giant lake of blood to her left. She rushed towards the reception desk. Brandon stepped into her path, putting his arms out to stop her. You need to leave. It's not safe. My best friend Marta was working in here last night, Candace said, desperation in her voice. I need to see. Brandon took a deep breath and nodded, allowing the young student to pass and peer through the window. Her hands flew to her mouth and she stepped back, shaking her head in denial and disbelief. You! Blanchard suddenly barked, raising his weapon as he stared down the hallway. Hands where I can see them! He motioned to his team. Light! I need light! Dudley whipped out his flashlight and pressed himself against the corner of the wall and held his arm out, shining it down the hallway around the busted door. There were three people standing down there, illuminated by the dim glow, splattered with blood. One of them, a young woman in what was once pale pink scrubs, was missing what looked like a considerable chunk of flesh from her neck. The frat boy next to her had blood all around his mouth, streaming down the front of his stiff, collared polo shirt. A boy on the other side in shorts and a t-shirt was visibly missing pieces of his arms and legs. Dudley's hand shook as he painted the scene with light, and as he pointed it at their milky, ghostly eyes, they screeched and sprinted down the hallway. Down on the ground! Blanchard bellowed. Get down on the ground! The screams of the three people rushing him drowned out his voice and they did not get down on the ground. They looked murderous and crazed, mouths black as they opened with their inhuman shrieks. He had no choice but to open fire. He hit them all in a burst of three, sent a mass, as per his training, blood splattering all over the hallway. But they didn't drop. Dudley dropped the flashlight as the runners reached the doors, shock overtaking him at how they were still moving while riddled with bullets. Blanchard cried out as the assailants crashed into him, and screamed in shocked pain as three sets of teeth bit into his tender body. Dalton was the first to snap out of shock, and he opened fire on the pile of bodies in the center of the room. Brandon grabbed Candace's arm and shoved the quivering girl behind him, giving her a boost up through the reception window. She pressed her back against the wall, lowering herself to the floor and covering her ears in fear. Pieces came off of the assailants, painting Blanchard's twitching form in human goulash. The frat boy finally dropped, half his face gone as a bullet pierced his eye. The other boy lunged for Dalton, latching onto his hand as he struggled to reload. Dalton grabbed his knife from his belt and plunged it over and over into his attacker's shoulder and chest, trying to get him to let go. He screamed as the boy tore his hand apart with his teeth, and in his panic drove the knife into his skull. The boy immediately dropped to the floor in a crumpled heap of pungent flesh. Dalton stared helplessly at the remaining girl, the nurse in the pink scrubs practically feasting on Blanchard's now still form. Brandon approached, handgun raised, and put a bullet into the back of the nurse's head. The three SWAT members stood for a beat, stock still, brains desperately trying to process what the hell had just happened. Holy shit, Dudley suddenly cried, eyes as big as saucers, as he stared in horror down the hallway. Dalton turned just in time to see a dozen blood-spattered people running full tilt towards him. The first five tore into him before he could even react, tearing his flesh apart as he screamed in agony. Go! Brandon yelled to Dudley, and then dove through the reception window himself. Just as he shut the glass, he saw Dudley make an escape through the front door, several of those things tearing out behind him. Candace rocked back and forth, hands still over her ears, breaths coming in and out in ragged gasps. Brandon dropped to his knees, putting a reassuring hand on her shoulder, though he had no idea how he could reassure her at all. They sat in terrified silence as they listened to the things in the next room tear Dalton to pieces with their teeth. Chapter 4 8.45 a.m. The noises of smacking lips and hungry groans dissipated, 
and Brandon gave it a full minute of silence before he squeezed Candace's shoulder. We have to go, he whispered. She nodded jerkily, taking a deep breath and wiping at her eyes. Okay, I'm going to open this window and sweep the room, he said, pointing up at the reception window. I want you to stay in here until I say it's clear. She nodded again. Gotcha. He stood up and slid the window open as slowly and silently as he possibly could. There was only one of their attackers wandering outside of the front door, but something caught its eye and it tore off. Brandon opened the window the rest of the way and lifted his leg to climb over the desk. He froze. What is it? Candace whispered, staring up at him. Brandon couldn't speak. He could only stare as Blanchard's corpse began to move. The fallen SWAT officer's legs twitched, his arms shooting out to his sides before he sat straight up. His eyes looked like they were covered in a foggy film as they turned to Brandon, and his black mouth opened in an inhuman shriek. He launched onto his bloody legs and rushed toward the reception window. Brandon finally remembered how to move and leapt back, drawing his handgun. Kanda shrieked and Crab walked backwards along the floor, jumping up so that she was behind the living SWAT officer. Cover your ears, Brandon instructed as he raised the gun, staring down Blanchard, who didn't seem to have the coordination to get over and through the window. The blonde nodded and did as she was told, backing up against the far wall as Brandon approached his co-worker. I'm sorry about this man, Brandon said, and held out the gun to fire into Blanchard's throat. His dead co-worker continued to groan and gnash his teeth, reaching out with bloody hands for his living companion. Brandon took a deep breath and pursed his lips, then held the gun to Blanchard's forehead. He pulled the trigger, blowing brains all over the reception area, his comrade finally falling limp and quiet. Candace lowered her hands, wringing them in front of her. Why did you shoot him in the neck first? In the firefight, I swear it looked like the only effective shot was a headshot. Brandon replied, still staring at the corpse of his friend in disbelief. I had to test the theory. Why the neck? the blonde asked, voice growing a bit more confident. The heart would have been much more effective kill shot, no? Brandon tapped his chest. Bulletproof. He reached out and pushed at Blanchard's shoulders, letting the corpse fall to the floor before he swept the room with his eyes again. He hopped over the desk fully, bringing his gun back up before peeking around the busted doors into the hallway. Are we good? Candace hissed from the window, suddenly feeling claustrophobic in the small office. She wanted to get outside, breathe air that wasn't tainted with blood. Brandon looked down at Dalton's body, torn into a complete mess. There were exposed bones everywhere, his body ripped to pieces. Brandon took a deep breath and fired a single round into his dead co-worker's forehead. Yeah, we're good, he replied. She hopped through the window as he collected the leftover ammunition from his dead friends. He grabbed Dalton's handgun and held it out to the blonde. Here, I get the sense you're going to need that, he said. She took it and checked to make sure a round was chambered and the safety was on before tucking it into the back of her pants. She turned and leaned over Blanchard, snatching up his assault rifle and a fresh mag. Whoa, now! Brandon held up a hand. Be careful with that. Candace raised an eyebrow. Officer Shelton, where are you from? She asked. Born and raised here in Austin, ma'am, he replied. Well, I was born and raised in a small West Texas town that had more rattlesnakes than people, she replied as she checked over the weapon. If I was a betting woman, I'd say I've spent more time using a gun like this than you have. Brandon chuckled as she cocked the gun and held out two more mags. In that case, you'll probably need these as well. She accepted them and stuffed her pockets before widening her stance with a nod. He approached the front door and peeked out into the quad, where moments ago there had been peaceful students studying and relaxing in the summer sun. Now there were bloodstains and cries and corpses feasting on flesh. Brandon let out a heavy sigh. What's with the sigh, officer? Candace asked finally finding her voice now that she was armed and full of adrenaline. Don't be giving up on me now. Sorry, it's just... He trailed off and shook his head, pointing to a tree about forty yards away. She pressed her lips into a thin line at the sight of Dudley, dead-eyed as six corpses ate his limbs. Sorry about your friend, she said quietly. Brandon nodded. 
Thanks. I'll have time to mourn later. He looked around. Right now, I'm more worried about getting us out of here. My sigh was in response to Dudley over there having the keys to the SUV we came in. Well, you're in luck, officer, Candace replied. Both my boyfriend and I have cars, but you have to help me get to him. You do that, and we're out of here. Brandon looked down at her with a firm nod. You have a deal. Where is he? Classroom building A, room 217, she replied. He blinked at her. And how do we get there? Quickest way is going through the student union right across the quad, she said, inclining her head outside. When we get in, we hug the wall on the right until we get to the double doors. Then it's down a connecting hallway and up a flight of stairs. Brandon turned his attention back to the quad, reassessing their chances. The coast was mostly clear, but a few corpses rushed into the open doors of the student union. Shit, he cursed. Those things just got into the union. We gotta go. The armed duo burst into the quad, shoes squelching in the fresh blood as they skirted the corpses that would soon be standing up again. There were a few screeches as some of the feasting creatures noticed them and gave chase. Screams and shots echoed inside the Union, and Brandon and Candace threw themselves inside just in time to see a terrified-looking security guard disappear under a throng of hungry corpses. The doors are there, Candace cried pointing past a group of students that tore off in different directions from the now-abandoned coffee shop. Brandon nodded, moving forward with his gun raised. I'll take point, you cover the side, he said, and the blonde raised her own weapon, following dutifully. A few zombies leapt up from the security guard and tore towards them, but Brandon dropped them easily with shots to the forehead. He opened the double doors and swept the hallway, noting only a young couple cowering in the corner to the left. Candace motioned to them as she breached the doors. Come on, we have to go, she urged. The boy got up, a bloody rag wrapped around his hand. He grasped the girl with his good hand and dragged her along, whimpers echoing behind the armed pair leading the way. Where are the stairs? Brandon asked. Candace waved ahead of them. End of the hall, on the right. He picked up the pace, the four of them running as hard as they could. Inhuman cries cut through the air behind them like bullets as a dozen or so corpses barreled into the hallway behind them. Brandon reached the door at the end first and threw it open, holding it open with his body for the others as he fired into the pursuing horde. He managed to fell two of them, barely tripping up the others as they scrambled over to get to their meal. Candace led the way up the stairs, peeking out the door to the second floor, her heart leaping when she saw there were no creatures skulking about. She waved the young couple through. Get to room 217, she instructed, and they took off as she waited for Brandon to catch up. He whipped past her, and they slammed the door shut behind them on the stampede of corpses thundering up the stairs. Grab that broom and shove it in the handles, he grunted as he pressed himself against the metal door. The blonde pursed her lips. I don't think that's going to hold very long, officer. Doesn't need to, he replied. Just has to buy us time to get to the classroom. Candace sprinted over to the mop bucket and broom that had been left in the corner, and then rushed back, jamming it through the handles as securely as she could. Go, he instructed, and she nodded, turning tail and running full tilt for room 217. Brandon waited until she was about halfway there, and then pushed off of the door. He was barely eight steps away when the sound of splintering wood echoed behind him, and he skidded into the classroom as the broom exploded, zombies pouring into the hallway. He dove into the classroom, and Candace slammed the door behind him, locking it and pressing her back against the door. Brandon and the other girl dragged the heavy professor's desk over and pushed it against the door, effectively blocking it. They backed away from the door, chests heaving, sweaty and blood-spattered and disheveled. "'What in the world are y'all doing?' a girl asked from her desk, pulling a set of white earbuds from her ears. "'We're trying to study in here.' The quartet turned to look at the three students sitting at desks with books and papers everywhere, working on schoolwork, as if there were nothing amiss outside. Study time is over, Brandon declared, and one boy's eyes widened when he recognized his girlfriend, armed to the teeth and bent over to catch her breath. Candace, are you okay? he asked as he rushed over to her. Why do you have a gun? She nodded, reaching up to clutch his arm in relief. Two guns, actually she huffed, offering a smile. But yeah, I'm okay, thanks to Officer Shelton. The young man extended his hand to Brandon. Thank you, Officer, I'm Matt. 
he was cut off by the door rattling in its hinges. Loud bangs as the corpses slammed into the door. The girl with the earbuds leapt from her desk in shock. Who's... who's out there? she gasped. I think a better question is what's out there, Brandon replied, shaking his head. But the answer to both is things that want to harm us. The boy from the hallway held up his hand and removed the bloody rag, revealing a missing pinky and clear teeth marks in his palm. No shit, he said. Look what they did to my hand. Did you get bitten? Candice asked. No, Blondie. It was a firm handshake gone awry, he snapped. Of course I got bitten. Candice and Brandon shared a concerned look, and the SWAT officer unholstered his handgun, pointing it at the sarcastic boy. Stop! his companion shrieked, throwing herself in front of him. What are you doing? Brandon cocked the gun. He's infected, which means he's a danger to all of us in here, he explained gently. Holy shit! the earbud girl breathed. Are those zombies out there? Matt scoffed. Zombies? Like movie zombies? It's as good a description as any, Brandon confirmed. Uh, yeah. If that's the case, pop Kenny in the head so we don't get eaten. Earbud girl pointed at the bitten boy. Fuck you, Gwen! he cried. Simple bites take days to turn a victim. Anyone with even a cursory knowledge of horror films knows that. I just got bitten ten minutes ago. Brandon paused for a moment and then holstered his gun. Candice, you're some kind of nurse, right? Actually, I was studying to be a doctor, but thanks for gender stereotyping me, she replied, a playful tone in her voice. Apologies, he replied with a chuckle. We just spent the last half hour fighting zombies who want to eat our faces off. Please forgive my lack of political correctness. I'll let it slide this time, she held up a finger. But you're on notice, mister. Appreciated and duly noted, Brandon agreed with a wink. Would you please check his hand and get it wrapped up, Dr. Candace? She nodded. Can do. She motioned for him to sit down at a nearby desk and dragged a chair over to sit across from him so she could examine his wound. Brandon leaned against the wall on the other side. All right, Kenny, was it? he asked, and the pale boy nodded in response. Good deal. I'm Brandon Shelton with Austin Swat. Is this your girlfriend? Phoebe, the girl hovering behind him put in. Yes, I'm his girlfriend. Okay, Brandon replied with a nod and leaned forward. Kenny, you don't want anything bad to happen to Phoebe, right? he asked. Kenny hissed as Candace probed at his wound. Of course not. I didn't think so, the officer continued. So listen, these bites are infectious. Two of my friends who were bitten came back as those things. Granted, they were killed and then came back, so we don't know how long you have, or even if this bite is going to kill you. So I'm going to make you a deal, because I'm sure you don't want to be the reason Phoebe gets hurt. If you promise to keep us up to date on how you're feeling and let Candace look at your wound regularly, I won't shoot you in the face. Does that sound like a good deal to you? Kenny nodded vigorously. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, deal, Brandon replied and cut it out with the sir bullshit, making me feel old. Thank you, officer, Phoebe gushed, her voice thick. He waved her off. Shelton is fine, and you're welcome. He turned to the other three kids and crossed his arms. Okay, lightning round time. Two simple questions. What's your name, and are you bitten? Go. Gwen and no, earbud girl said first. Not into biting, at least not any more, she smirked. The boy next to her wrinkled his nose. I'm Jonas, and also no, he said. Matt and no bites, Candace's boyfriend added quickly. Now can you answer one question for us? Sure, Brandon replied. Shoot. Matt took a deep breath. What do we do now? The officer shook his head. The only thing we really can do. Hurry up and wait. Chapter 5 10 AM Matt crossed his arms as he watched the quad from the classroom window, watching a pack of zombies suddenly leap up from a feast and take off in the same direction. I hope whoever spooked them can run fast, he muttered. Candace rubbed his shoulder gently. Hope whoever spooked them has a safe place to run to. Not sure there are really safe spaces left, Brandon replied with a sigh, turning away from the window. The quad had become a bloodbath. Not a single patch of green grass left amidst all the body parts. We're safe in here, aren't we? Candace asked. Well, safe is relative, the officer explained. 
Sure, they can't get in, but we can't get out. And unless there is a mini-fridge hidden in the closet, there isn't a whole lot of food or water in here, which means we're going to have to move sooner rather than later. Move? Jonas looked up from the hearts game that Phoebe had started in the corner. Are you crazy? We're safe in here. Let's just sit back, relax, and wait to be rescued. Gwen rolled her eyes and fanned herself with her cards. Oh, that's cute. You think somebody is going to come rescue us? Why wouldn't they? he replied, narrowing his eyes at her. It's literally their job. Why don't you ask Swat Boy over there if he thinks we're going to be rescued? She asked, motioning to Brandon. Pretty sure they don't send Swat members out on their own, so unless he's playing hooky, it means the best and brightest Austin PD has to offer has already been wiped out. Jonas's face drained of color, and he set his cards down on the table before turning to the window. Come on, Shelton, she's just being dramatic. He swallowed hard. Right? Brandon shook his head, avoiding the gazes of the student staring expectantly at him. Sorry, but she's not. We lost contact with our Alpha team this morning, when they were dispatched to the student medical center for a disturbance, he explained. My team, at least the ones who weren't out with that sickness that's going around, showed up to investigate. In a matter of minutes, we went from four members to just me. He turned back to the card game, lips set in a thin line. Gwen laid the Queen of Spades down onto the pile in the center and pushed it towards him with a sly smile, batting her eyes at him. Jonas shoved his hand and the trick back into the center of the table in defeat, processing what the officer had just said. Phoebe reluctantly collected the cards, shuffling them absently and avoiding eye contact. Can I check your hand? Candice asked, approaching the table. Kenny nodded and turned to her. Sure, go for it. She unwrapped the bandage they'd made out of Phoebe's cardigan, and he winced as the cotton stuck to the wound. Sorry, the blonde said gently. I know this isn't comfortable. He gritted his teeth. Not your fault. She recoiled at the sight of his wound, and then wrapped it back up again quickly, tying the thin fabric back around his wrist. What is it? Phoebe asked, worry lacing her tone. It's... it's nothing, Candace replied, shaking her head. Just not used to wounds like that. Kenny sighed. Look, I know I'm fucked. You don't have to lie for my benefit. It's showing signs of infection, she said slowly. It's not spreading too rapidly, but I can tell it's there. He let out a deep breath. How long do I have? I honestly have no idea, she admitted. He sighed. Well, I appreciate the honesty. Jonas grunted and snatched the deck of cards from Phoebe, dealing a fresh hand. So, what do you think is causing all this? he asked. I bet it's the sickness that's going around. I mean, that would make a lot of sense, because this thing started at the med center. He paused, brow furrowing in thought. Or maybe it's global warming? You know, like the Earth is trying to purge us like a virus? Or maybe it's God! Gwen gasped dramatically, putting a hand to her chest. He's just tired of all of the heathens existing. Or hell, maybe he's just bored and wants to fuck with us. She smiled and leaned forward. Or, you know, maybe it doesn't fucking matter why it's happening, since it doesn't really change our situation in the slightest. Jonas shrugged. So, you just want me to shut up and deal the cards? Can't beat your ass until you do, she replied smugly. Candace approached the window again and said quietly, his hand is getting worse. Worse, like we have to deal with it? Brandon asked, voice low. She shook her head. We're okay for right now, but we need to keep a close eye on it, especially since we're all stuck in here. We won't be stuck in here much longer if I have any say in it, the officer replied. Matt perked up. What do you have in mind? Your cars are that way, right? Brandon asked and pointed to the building across the quad. Matt nodded. Yeah, two buildings over but we're never going to make it outside. What if we use that? Brandon asked and pointed up to a skywalk on the fourth floor. The young man's eyebrows hit his hairline. That's great, but how in the hell do we get there? You want to crack the door and open fire on how many of them are in the hallway? No, we need to avoid firing as much as possible, the officer replied. We're too close to the student union, so if we start shooting we run the risk of attracting a mob. Matt threw his hands up. Great! So we'll just spider man up the building and life will be great. That's exactly what I was thinking, Brandon agreed. The young man gaped at him. I I wasn't being serious. Well, I don't mean everybody climb up, 
Just me, the officer replied. I'll get up to the third floor, come back down the stairs, and lure the ones outside the door away. That will give you a chance to get everybody to the opposite stairwell and up to the fourth floor. Candace shook her head. That sounds borderline suicidal. Nothing borderline about it, but I really don't see another way, Brandon shrugged. And if you don't make it? Matt pursed his lips. Brandon saluted him. Good luck and Godspeed? Not exactly the answer I was looking for, the young man snapped. No advice on where to go? Sorry to disappoint, but I'm making this shit up as I go along. The officer turned to the window and slid it open, unlatching the clips from the screen and pulling it inside as evidenced by the fact that I'm about to climb out of a perfectly good window. He slung his assault rifle from his back and held it out to Matt. I'm gonna want that back. Whoa, whoa, what's going on? Jonas demanded, standing up from the card game. I'm clearing the path so we can get the hell out of here, Brendan replied as he swung a leg out of the window. Candace turned to the four students in the corner. So wrap up your game and get ready to move. Chapter 6 Brandon slipped out of the window, balancing on the narrow ledge on his tiptoes. He glanced down, frowning less at the height than the group of zombies clustering below, reaching up at him with crimson hands. It certainly ranks up there with the worst ideas I've ever had, he muttered, and took a deep breath before reaching up to the third floor ledge. He closed his eyes for a moment and focused drowning out the groans of the dead peanut gallery waiting for him to fall into their mouths. With a groan, he pulled himself up, bracing an ankle up on the ledge and vaulting up to get a better grip on the windowsill. He let out a deep breath as he got to his feet, peering in the window to an empty classroom. He's up, Candace's voice floated up from the second floor window, reporting back to the others. Brandon noted the closed classroom door and then pulled out his retractable baton reeling back and punching it into the window, still holding the frame tightly. He ducked as low as he could on the ledge, bracing himself in case of a surprise corpse, but there was no response outside of the excited zombies in the quad below. He hopped through the window and then poked his head back out to give Matt a thumbs up, the boy staring up expectantly at him from the second floor. Brandon drew his handgun and swept the room, walking silently to the door. He cracked the door and peeked out, then opened it a little more, straining his ears. There was nothing. He left the door open behind him in case he needed a quick getaway, and moved quickly and quietly to the stairwell. It was empty, the zombies all having bustled out to cluster around the second-floor classroom. He paused at the sight of a wooden door jamb, and picked it up before heading down to the second floor. He opened the door as quietly as a mouse and slid the little wedge underneath to open the stairwell door wide. He took a deep breath, taking in the pack of zombies still pressing up against the classroom door. Brandon took a deep breath and then let out a piercing whistle. The horde shrieked and turned to him, taking in the sight of fresh meat briefly before tearing down the hallway towards him. He turned tail and barreled up the stairs, taking them two at a time and skidded out into the third-floor hall, stopping just short of the classroom. He waited for the zombies to bustle into sight, snarling and snapping, and then dove into the classroom, slamming the door shut behind him. Chapter 7 Matt pressed his ear against the classroom door as the shrieks faded off down the hallway. As they dissipated completely, he nodded to the group of his fellow students behind him. He quietly opened the door, slipping out and looking up and down the hall to double-check they were alone. Candace brought up the rear, assault rifle raised and at the ready. They jogged quickly to the far stairwell, and as Matt opened the door his foot clanged against it, sending an echo down the hallway. This attracted the attention of one straggler zombie that had struggled to get up the stairs after Brandon. Matt raised his gun, but then thought better of it, lowering it and thrusting his arms out instead. Candace stifled a shriek as she watched her boyfriend take the corpse in his strong hands, sending it tumbling towards the classroom they'd just vacated. He descended upon it with a hard kick, sending the zombie flopping inside, where he slammed the door shut to trap it. Candace immediately clutched his arm, eyes wide, 
Don't ever do that again, she whispered firmly. He smiled and winked down at her, and gave her forehead a quick peck before leading the group up to the fourth floor. As they emerged, Brandon pushed off of the wall he leaned against, waiting until they were close before greeting them quietly. Any problems? he asked. Matt shrugged. Had a straggler, but I was able to contain him without incident. Good, the SWAT officer replied with a firm nod. Now, where are we going? Through those doors by the stairwell, Candice replied, motioning with her gun. It's the walkway that leads over to the dorms. All right, let's do it before we draw any more attention to ourselves, Brandon suggested. This time he brought up the rear while Candice and Matt led the way across to the dorms, the terrified students scurrying along. These doors open towards the walkway, so I don't think they'll be able to follow us, the officer said as they approached the dorms. They don't seem to have much reasoning power, so hopefully pulling on a door to open it is beyond their capability. Matt shook his head. Here's hoping you didn't just jinx us. You and me both, Brandon replied with a small chuckle. He opened the door quietly, peering back and forth down the hallway to make sure there weren't any surprises. He motioned for the others, and Candice led the way, gun raised. Jonas jingled his keys. My room is just up there. We can grab some food and water. Hopefully my roommate Joe is there. We could use another person. Hopefully he's more useful than you, Gwen scoffed. He rolled his eyes. He plays linebacker for the football team, so yeah, pretty useful in this situation. Brandon, Matt, and Candice took out of positions around the door, protecting Jonas from any unwanted attacks as he put the key in the lock of his room. He pushed the door open, and then there was a blur as what felt like a truck hit him square in the chest. Gwen screamed as Joe chomped down on Jonas's throat, squashing him against the far wall with his considerable frame. Brandon whipped around and fired his handgun point-blank into the back of Joe's head. The linebacker dropped into a thick heap on the floor. Jonas gurgled and gasped, attempting to put pressure on his throat, but flopped over his roommate, unmoving. Brandon took aim and put a bullet in his skull as well. What the fuck? Gwen cried, lunging forward to shove at the officer's chest. He was going to reanimate, and soon, he explained keeping his voice as calm and gentle as he could. You don't know that! She pushed him again, tears streaming down her face in waterfalls. Candice reached out to take her wrist. It's true, she said firmly. I've seen it too. The sound of rattling doors and pounding fists on wood suddenly echoed throughout the hallway. The corpses within apparently having heard the commotion and psyching themselves up for a feast. How strong are these doors? Brandon asked. A sharp crack of wood pierced the air, and Matt took a deep breath. Let's just say the university went with the lowest construction bid. We gotta go, now, the SWAT officer said, and motioned towards the stairwell they had originally intended to make a run for. Candace led the charge, dodging wood splinters and dead hands punching through doors. They reached the stairs, and Brandon pushed through to take point down the stairwell, gun at the ready. He took the stairs two at a time, satisfied with the heavy clunk of the fourth-floor door behind the group keeping pace with him. There was a sudden crash from the bottom that echoed up towards them, followed by groans and gurgles. That can't be good, Brandon muttered. He leaned over the railing to see a veritable sea of zombies scrambling to get up over each other to the live meal above. Second floor, go, the officer cried, taking position at the second-floor landing. He took his assault rifle from Matt as the group threw themselves into the hallway and unloaded into the horde, scrambling up towards him. Bodies fell, tripping up the ones behind them, but there seemed to be no end to the wave of corpses. When the mag was empty, Brandon turned and bolted down the hallway where Gwen fumbled with the keys to her dorm room. Matt stared fearfully at the horde about ten yards behind the sprinting SWAT officer, and then snatched the girl's keys, shoving it into the lock and throwing open the door. Candace rushed in first to hopefully kill anything undead inside, but left room for the others to bustle in behind her. Matt waited, jaw clenched and heart pounding, praying for Brandon to make it fast enough. He dove inside just in the nick of time, and Matt slammed the door shut, throwing himself against it. Candace shoved a filing cabinet in beside him, sitting down with her back against it as the door rattled and thumped in its frame. Will it hold? Matt huffed. Brandon put his hands against it. I think so. 
but we may want to take shifts leaning up against it. Shifts? Gwen ran her hands through her hair, resisting the urge to tear at the roots. How long are we going to be here? Brandon shook his head and clenched his jaw. He didn't know. Chapter 8 11 a.m. Brandon paced back and forth in the small, tense space, radio to his lips. Come in, APD. This is Officer Shelton. Please respond. Static. Candace re-wrapped Kenny's hand, lips pressed into a thin line at the greenish goo and putrid smell emanating from the wound. She didn't have to say anything. They both knew the infection was getting worse. APD, come in. This is Officer Shelton. Please respond. Static. Phoebe nursed a bottle of water and absently stroked the hair on the back of Kenny's head. It was matted with sweat and he looked pale. But they were all in shock. She told herself that it couldn't just be the infection. They all looked pale and were sweaty from all the running. It didn't mean he didn't have much time left, right? This is Officer Shelton. Come in, APD. Please respond. Static. Matt sat against the filing cabinet. The pounding had stopped a little while ago, but they figured it couldn't hurt to stay studious. Plus, he felt less helpless this way, like he was contributing somehow. He watched Gwen as she stared dejectedly out the window, curled up into the smallest ball possible. She hadn't spoken a word since they'd gotten there, and he wondered if Jonas's death was replaying over and over in her head, because it was in his. "'Come in, APD. This is Officer Shelton.' It's been like this for an hour and a half now, Matt cut in. I think we have to assume we're on our own. The SWAT officer scowled down at the sitting boy for a moment, but then let out a deep breath and sat down on the edge of the bed. Yeah, I know. I just don't like the thought of being the last officer standing. There has to be somebody else out there other than me. Hey, look on the bright side, Matt replied. If we survive this, you should be in line for a promotion, right? Captain? Super Captain? Whatever the top job is. Brandon stared down at his hands. Yeah, and all it took was the death of every one of my co-workers. Ah, the student groaned, clenching his fists at the thoughtlessness of his joke. I'm sorry, man. I was just trying to lighten the mood a bit. No harm done, Brandon assured him, forcing a smile. It's all good. Candace approached Gwen carefully. How's it looking out there? Like a moving sea of death. The girl in the window replied, voice a level monotone. The blonde stood on her tiptoes to peek outside. Nah, looks more like a creek of death than a sea, she joked. Gwen turned away from the window long enough to glare at her companion. Really? Sorry, Candace replied, putting her hands up in surrender. I'll leave you to it. She turned back to her boyfriend and headed over, plopping down on the floor next to him. He took her hand gratefully, giving her knuckles a soft kiss. How's our patient doing? Brandon asked. She sighed. His hand is getting worse, but he seems to be in good health otherwise. I don't think we have to worry about him turning any time soon. Well, at least that's one thing going our way, the officer replied. I just looked outside, she continued, and there's only a dozen or so in the courtyard. Itching for another fight? Brandon teased. She stuck her tongue out at him. No, but if we want to get the hell out of here, we don't really have much of a choice, do we? Since I'm guessing backup isn't on the way. He shook his head in resignation. I assume y'all's car is across the way, then. Yep, on the other side of the lecture hall building, Matt said. It's a long-ass run to go around it, though. Brandon cocked his head. So why don't we go through it? Because there's no skywalk to get over to it, the young man replied. We'd have to enter through the ground floor, and there's no guarantee those doors are unlocked. The officer nodded. Ah, so if we go that route and are closed, we're dinner, Candace finished. Brandon surveyed the other three in the room. They didn't look like they did a particular amount of running. How far of a run is it if we go around the lecture hall? He asked. Matt shrugged. I don't know. Two fifty, maybe three hundred yards? Let's be realistic, the officer said with a sigh. If we go that route, we're not all making it to the car. I don't think some of them can remember the last time they ran that fast. Phoebe scowled. We can hear you, you know that, right? Did I say anything that wasn't true? Brandon raised an eyebrow. Her cheeks turned a light shade of pink. Well, no, she admitted. 
But come on, manners, dude. We're going for the door, the officer declared. One step at a time, cowboy, Candace cut in. How do you propose we get out of here without attracting attention? Brandon approached the desk against the far wall and sifted through a few of her books there. He picked up a wooden ruler and turned it over in his hands, shoving it into his back pocket, before rifling through one of the drawers. He found a roll of packing tape and carried it over to the dresser. He took out his baton and lashed out to smash the mirror. Phoebe let out a small squeak and everyone in the room startled at the sudden noise, even Gwen from her perch by the window. Brandon laid the ruler down on the dresser and selected a long, thin shard of glass before using the tape to secure it to the piece of wood. Matt, I'm going to need you to move that filing cabinet over a bit, he said as he worked, and the young couple stood up and shoved it over so there was enough room for the officer to slide past. He knelt and laid down on his stomach, sliding the rule carefully under the gap at the bottom of the door. He tilted the ruler back and forth, surveying the hallway, and then pulled it back, getting to his feet. Okay, there are four of those things to the left and none to the right. We have more than enough ammo to take them out. Matt replied, holding up the rifle. Candace smacked him on the back of the head, earning a grunt and a flabbergasted noise of surprise as he gaped at her. Great idea, dumbass, she scoffed. Let's let every zombie on campus know where we are. Your girl is right, Brandon put in, stifling a smile at the put-out expression on the young man's face. We gotta take them out silently. Well, I'm open to ideas, Matt muttered, his rifle arm drooping in disappointment. The officer pursed his lips as he looked around the room again, this time fixating on the bed. "'Good thing this school skimmed on everything that went to the students,' he said, and motioned for Kenny and Phoebe to stand up. The young couple moved over to the dresser, Kenny leaning against it but careful not to put his hand in any of the glass. Brandon pulled the cheap metal frame out from the wall and flipped the mattress up so that it stood in the gap. Underneath were metal braces running across the frame. He popped out one of the four-foot-long beams and snatched the roll of packing tape from the dresser. He leaned the rod against the wood and produced his knife, using the tape to secure it to the end, creating a makeshift spear. "'Matt, give me six inches on the door,' he instructed. "'Candace, Phoebe, I'm gonna need the both of you backing him up. I'm gonna try to take care of these fuckers as quickly as I can. But if all of them are pushing on that door, they could easily break in.' The two women nodded, taking deep breaths to ready themselves, and stood on either side of Matt. The young man crouched and waited for Brandon to be ready. The officer nodded, and Matt dragged the filing cabinet back half a foot. It screeched against the linoleum, and the four zombies immediately turned and threw themselves into the door. The latch exploded with the impact, and the three students slammed their own bodies back against it, bracing it as best they could. Brandon took aim and then lunged forward, catching the first corpse in the eye. It slumped forward, another taking its place, bloody arm flapping all over the place through the gap. The SWAT officer took his time again to line up his strike, and stabbed forward again, avoiding the thrashing arm to stab right into the zombie's temple. The last two were easier, and as the hallway fell silent, the students let out a collective sigh of relief. Brandon held up a hand. Hang tight, you three, he said quietly. Give it a few minutes to make sure we didn't attract any unwanted attention. They stayed like statues against the door, holding it fast and straining their ears. Brandon half expected a fresh batch of corpses to come shrieking at them, but a few minutes ticked by of complete silence. He finally relaxed, and the students slumped, loosening their muscles. He nodded. Time to move. Chapter 9 The group of six stood at the doors to the courtyard, staring through the glass with somber trepidation. Okay, Brandon said in a low voice. I see one set of doors about sixty yards away. If they're locked, do we have any other options? Windows we can break out? Another set of doors? Anything? Candace shook her head. That's it, on this side of the building anyway. What's to the right? He pressed his face against the glass to try to see but the angle was impossible. It's the main walkway through campus, the blonde explained. I can only imagine the shit show that is at the moment, so I would recommend we avoid that at all costs. Brandon took a deep breath and stepped back from the glass. 
So if we can't get in through that set of doors, the only other option is to run to the left into the parking lot? Yep, she confirmed. Pretty much. He sighed. Fantastic. He checked his weapons, prompting to two armed students to do the same. Gwen gripped the spear, not having waited to not have a weapon for this journey. Okay, listen up, Brandon said, straightening his shoulders. We're going to bust out of this door quick. Matt, I want you to run as hard and fast as you can to those doors. Candace and I are going to cover you, and our flanks as you get up there. He gave each of the gun-toting students a hard look. Shoot only if necessary. As soon as that first shot goes off, we're going to be made, and we don't have much of a window to begin with. He waited for their nods of understanding, and then glanced at the other three. Okay, everybody ready? There was a round of more nods, and he put his hand on the door. Okay, here we go. He waited for Matt to lower into a springing position, and then threw open the door. The young man ran hard, not paying attention to anything on his left or right side, just focusing on the door. His only mission was the door. Brandon and Candace trotted after him, staying at a jog so that the others could keep up. Gwen kept her spear pointed away from her face, suddenly wondering if it was a good idea to be running with such a sharp object. The door slammed behind Kenny and Phoebe, and a chorus of groans and shrieks rose. Hurry, Brandon urged, keeping his eyes on Matt to make sure they were covering him from potential threats. Kenny, Phoebe squealed, and there was a thud as she fell to the ground. He turned and dove into the throng of zombies about to overwhelm his girlfriend. The motion caused them to stumble back into their brethren, tripping up a few, but enough of them were hungry enough that one managed to bite into his arm as he tried to help Phoebe up. He screamed in pain as his girlfriend screamed in horror, gripping his wrist for dear life and struggling to get to her feet. The remaining horde crashed into him, toppling the whole tableau down on top of the young woman. They're lost, keep going, Brandon cried tugging on Gwen's arm to get her legs to move. They caught up to Candace, the blonde wincing as the sounds of the young couple's screams grew muffled under the rapidly growing dog pile of rotting flesh. Matt finally reached to the door and yanked, his heart leaping into the heavens as the latch clicked and the handle turned. He headed in, handgun first, sweeping back and forth to be ready for anything coming his way. The blast of sudden sunlight hit a bloodied corpse in the face, and it opened its mouth into a gurgling scream before tearing towards him. Matt fired, hitting it in the chest, and let out a frustrated yell before emptying three more rounds into the monster, before finally catching it in the forehead. As the creature hit the floor with a wet smack, the other three barreled inside. Brandon jerked the door shut, and immediately raised his rifle, sweeping the area as the students huffed behind him. Kenny and Phoebe? Matt asked breathlessly. Candace shook her head, eyes wide and sad. Gwen clutched her spear to her chest, jaw clenched and lips pressed into a thin line. The blonde gave her shoulder a reassuring squeeze, and then noticed Brandon taking a position at the nearby hallway. She raised her gun and joined him, the two of them standing tense just in case a horde was going to come at them. Zombies hit the outer door behind them, banging hard, and though the quartet knew they couldn't get in, the noise was disconcerting. A few minutes trickled by, and no more zombies bore down on them from the inside. Brandon turned to Matt. Where are we going? Straight down the hallway, until we get to the end, the young man replied. Brandon nodded and led the group forward. He kept a brisk power walk, but stepped carefully and deliberately. He froze at the squeak of running shoes on tile, holding up his hands to stop the group behind him. A boy tore around the corner at the end of the hallway, and then skidded out, landing hard on the floor. He'd barely scrambled to his knees before a pack of zombies were on him, tearing him apart as he screamed for help. Several of the corpses noticed the group and led a charge towards them. This way, Brandon yelled, noting a set of double doors just ahead and to the left. Matt tore ahead and threw them open, holding it for the others to fly through. Candace and Gwen ran in first. Brandon bringing up the rear, and the quartet rushed down the descending staircase, towards the stage of the large lecture hall they'd broken into. As Matt and Brandon made it about halfway, the doors burst open behind them, as the zombies crashed inside. 
Candace stood tall on the stage, firing a spray of bullets into the oncoming horde. The lead zombies tumbled down the stairs, tripping up the ones behind them, buying the boys enough time to reach the raised platform. He gave Matt a boost, and then he and Candace pulled Brandon up, just missing the outstretched hands of the hungry corpses below. Gwen gripped her spear with white knuckles, the other three a heap on the stage, all four of them staring at the zombies clustered around the bottom of the stage. "'Why aren't they climbing?' Matt huffed. Brandon shook his head and got to his feet. "'Don't know, don't care,' he said. "'Just glad they aren't.' "'We've got a door,' Candace said, rushing over to the side of the stage. Gwen and Matt kept close to her. Brendan walked backwards, his gun still trained on the zombies in case they decided to swarm up over the edge. Any idea where it goes? he asked as the group clustered around the door. Kanda shrugged. Out of this room? Well, I guess that's enough of an improvement, the officer replied flatly. Lead the way. The blonde carefully opened the door, taking care to be as quiet as could be, and stepped into the narrow hallway. There were no signs of movement, and she waved the others after her. As Brandon stepped through last, he closed the door silently behind him, and then made sure that the latch was firm so they wouldn't have any dead creatures following them. He surveyed the hallway, noting the doors lining it. They all had names and titles on them, and he assumed they were offices for various teachers and staff on campus. He took the lead of the group, motioning to the end of the hallway. Does that lead to the parking lot? he asked. Not entirely sure, Matt bit his lip, but it's definitely in the right direction. Brendan nodded and led them silently towards the heavy door, their footfalls masked a lot better by the carpeted floor. There was a glass window on the door, but it was frosted, so all he could make out were fuzzy shapes in the sunlight. At least he could tell that the targeted light sources above meant another hallway. He took a step back as a few dark blobs staggered by. He took a deep breath after they passed and eased the door open a tiny crack. He noted a fire door down the hall and then quietly closed the latch again. Okay, it looks like our exit is just to the right, he whispered. Once we get clear of the building, how far is the parking lot? Candace leaned in. Pretty close, maybe twenty yards? And your car? he asked. It's a silver SUV and it's in the first handicapped spot to the right of the sidewalk, she replied. His brow furrowed. Handicap? He wrinkled his nose. Really? Hey, don't judge. She crossed her arms in defiance. You have any idea how difficult it is to find parking on this campus? Whatever. It's lucky for us that it's close, Brandon replied. Who's got the keys? Matt pulled a ring out of his pocket. Good to go. You comfortable driving in this insanity? The officer asked. The young man nodded. Been driving in Austin traffic all my life. I can handle it. Okay. I'm taking shotgun, Brandon said firmly. Gwen, you'll be behind me, and Candace, you're behind Matt. Any questions? There was a chorus of no, and he straightened his shoulders. All right, check your weapons, and let's do this. Chapter 10 The quartet of survivors tore out of the building and towards the parking lot. Candace's silver SUV shone in the sunlight like a beacon of hope. Two zombies leapt out from behind it, coming at them quickly, and Brandon stopped, took quick aim, and shot them each in the face in succession. Matt blew past the corpses falling to the ground and threw the driver's side door open, unlocking the rest as he jumped into the seat. Brandon aimed at the screams coming from the lecture hall building as several groups of zombies poured out of the nooks and crannies and doors and behind structures, streaming towards them like a hungry rally. He waited for Gwen and Candice to close themselves into the relative safety of the back seat, and then jumped into the passenger's side. Matt threw the vehicle into reverse just as the first wave of zombies slammed into the hood. The tires squealed and he whipped the wheel sharply to the left, spinning the SUV around quite well, considering the bulky size of the vehicle. He popped it into drive and peeled out, running over a few straggler zombies in the way. He drove across parking spaces to a side street and made a hard left turn, throwing everyone in the car to the right with a violent motion. Where are we headed? Brandon asked as he braced himself against the door. I-35 is a few blocks east of here, Matt replied, eyes hyper-focused on where he was steering. 
I know this time of day going into town is a bitch, but hopefully the path out of town is clear. I wouldn't count on it, the officer replied, but it's as good a plan as any. The girls gaped at the veritable chaos surrounding them. The sidewalks were covered in pools of blood, overflowing onto the streets in crimson rivers. Body parts were strewn everywhere, some full corpses with crushed heads, but mostly signs of dead having gotten up and wandered away. There were fires in a few of the storefronts, licking broken glass displays like the hungry tongues of the dead. Matt turned onto the main road that led to the interstate, and then immediately slammed on the brakes. Holy shit, he breathed. Hundreds of zombies packed the road, jammed between cars like sardines. There was an overturned transport truck blocking the street, having caused a traffic jam in which the hungry corpses swarmed. Why are they banging on the cars? Gwen asked, eyes wide as saucers, as she stared at the sea of rotting flesh. Brandon swallowed hard. Because there are people still inside. She shivered and covered her mouth, sitting back in her seat to digest that information. Alternate route? Matt asked. Gwen squeaked as a zombie smacked into the back door, leaving a gooey red smear across the glass. Maybe the drag? Brandon replied. Matt nodded. Let's do it. He pulled a quick U-turn, driving over the creature who'd tried to eat Gwen through the window. He drove towards the drag, which was a row of campus stores and bars on street level that led north. Hard left! Hard left! Brandon cried as they rounded the corner and came upon shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder zombies packing the street. Matt's reaction wasn't quite fast enough, and he smacked into the front of the horde. The SUV skidded and groaned over some corpses, the zombies quickly surrounding them. Gwen shrunk down against the seat with every smack against the glass, and Candice put a hand on her shoulder, holding up her rifle with her other hand. Fuck! Matt cried as he tried to reverse. We're stuck. One of the back wheels seemed to have bottomed out on a corpse underneath it. Brandon unclipped his seatbelt and opened the sunroof. When I start firing, you move forward. Then I want you to pop it in reverse and floor that son of a bitch. That extra speed should get us over the hump. Got it, Matt replied with a firm nod. Brandon wedged his foot onto the center console and rose through the sunroof. He took aim and began firing into the zombie heads at the front of the vehicle, to give them room to gun it forward. Candace looked worriedly at the back window, which was quickly darkening with ghouls lining up behind them. You'll have to hurry, or we're going to be trapped. Matt leaned over so he could yell up at the SWAT officer. Unload on them, or we're going to be stuck here. Brandon turned and glanced behind him, watching the sea of zombies flooding the street. Fucking hell, he muttered, and then flipped his weapon to full auto, unloading the remainder of the mag into the corpses near the hood of the SUV. Matt inched forward a little further, and Brandon plopped himself back into the passenger seat. As soon as his seatbelt clicked shut, the young man floored the SUV in reverse, which gave them just enough speed to bump over the zombie hump. The tires struggled a bit with the falling corpses behind them, but the SUV managed to pick up speed as they pushed through the last line of creatures. Matt made sure he was clear of zombies before making a frantic three-point turn. Where are we going, Shelton? He cried as he turned into the park, driving across the grass to avoid the zombies staggering around. Some corpses were close enough to run at the roaring vehicle, but Matt had enough speed now that the zombies just bounced off of the sides like ping-pong balls. Head to campus, Brandon replied. Matt let out a throaty noise of disbelief. What? Head to the tower, the officer motioned out the window at the UT tower. Candace leaned forward to yell at him over his shoulder. What the hell are we going to do at that tower? I don't fucking know, Brandon groaned. We might be able to signal a chopper. Are you kidding me? Gwen shrieked. What kind of plan is that? He clenched and unclenched his jaw. It's the best one we have at the moment, but I'm certainly open to suggestions. The girls slumped back in their seats, unable to come up with a valid argument. Matt tightened his hands around the steering wheel, taking a breath before easing right to head towards campus. The quartet was silent for the rough ride across the park, and didn't make a noise even when he jumped the curb onto the sidewalk, barely slowing down. Two more buildings and then hang a right. It's a straight shot. Candace instructed. Matt nodded. Got it, hun. 
He sped past more zombies, taking off a few greedy and reaching hands in the process. He punched the gas and sped around the corner at the end, but wasn't anticipating the giant group of zombies standing just out of sight. The impact stopped the vehicle on a dime, the whole left side of the vehicle lurching off of the ground. As the tires smacked back down on the pavement, Matt's teeth clacked together and he punched the brake. Except it wasn't the brake. It was the gas, and the SUV went careening up a staircase on two wheels. Kanda screamed something unintelligible, and Brandon barely registered enough to brace his hands against the ceiling as the vehicle flipped clean over. The SUV skidded to a screeching stop on its roof, and Brandon knew he had to take action, or all four of them would be overwhelmed in seconds. He unclipped his seatbelt and shoved himself out of the shattered passenger's side window. As soon as his top half emerged, a zombie lunged for him, and he lashed out, clutching its collar in his adrenaline-fueled grip. It struggled and thrashed, teeth gnashing as it tried to get to its meal, and Brandon struggled for his gun. He finally managed to release it and fired point-blank into the zombie's forehead. He quickly staggered to his feet, assessing the zombies circling the overturned vehicle. He dispatched one, hoping to buy the others some time to get their bearings. He wanted to reach back in to grab Gwen, but he knew as soon as he bent over he'd be vulnerable, and he was no use to these kids if he were dead. He stepped forward, trying to force back the several zombies closing in on the SUV, but froze at the sound of Gwen's panicked screams. He whipped around to see two zombies dragging her out the window, tearing her flesh with their teeth, and the jagged glass sticking every which way. Shelton, come on! Candace screamed from the other side of the car. He grimaced as Gwen's shrieks turned to gurgles, jaw clenched as he tore across the courtyard after Matt and Candace. Despite the adrenaline, the trio was tired and battered from the accident, and the zombies running after them were gaining ground. Matt hit the door first, but it was locked. Candace shoved him out of the way and unloaded a series of shots into the door handle, busting it open. Brandon shoved them through as he got there, and the three of them slammed back against it to hold the zombies outside where they belonged. Look for the stairs, Brandon screamed, and Candace pointed at the door on the far end with the sign for the stairwell. There, she cried, far end of the room. Brandon dug in his heels with a grunt. Okay, I got this, he said. You two get to the stairs and make sure it's clear. What about you? Candace argued. I'm not going to let you sacrifice yourself for us. He let out an exasperated laugh. I wasn't planning on it, he assured her. When you get in there, I'm going to run like hell to you, hoping I'm faster than they are. Okay, good, the blonde replied. Ready? She nodded to Matt, and the couple took off for the stairwell. Brandon gritted his teeth as the full force of the horde smacked against his back. He didn't know how much more of this he could take. His knees began to shake with the strain. There was a pang in his chest when he had the errant thought that Blanchard would have had a field day making fun of him if his legs buckled under the pressure. Start climbing, Candace demanded, as she and Matt reached the door. Make sure we're clear all the way up. He gripped her wrist. What are you going to do? Cover him. She slipped in her last mag and readied her stance as her boyfriend headed up the stairs, his own gun at the ready. She let out an ear-splitting whistle to signal to Brandon. The SWAT officer nodded and jammed the barrel of his rifle into the ever-widening crack in the door. He unloaded the remainder of his mag blindly, hoping to buy himself a few precious seconds. He broke away from the door and sprinted as fast as his exhausted legs would carry him towards the stairwell. He burst inside just seconds before the horde and hugged the wall to the left to give Candice room to fire from the first landing. Bodies piled up behind him, and he reloaded his rifle as he passed her. Get two floors above me and get ready to fire again, he instructed, and she nodded, taking the stairs two at a time. He darted after her, stopping on a landing to fire another stream of bullets into the oncoming pack. Corpses fell left and right, slowing the ascent, some flopping over the railing and others being trampled beneath their brethren. He turned and bolted up, grabbing Candace's arm on the way by. Come on, we can make it, he yelled, and she followed him the two of them practically flying up the stairs and hoping to hell that Matt was okay and the top was cleared. Hurry up, 
the man in question yelled from the top, holding open the door to the observation deck. The duo leapt through the door, and Brandon slammed the door shut. It was a thick metal fire door, and it opened outwards, so whatever was still walking in the stairwell wouldn't be able to push it open. Brandon did a quick sweep of the room, but found only historical pictures and texts. The room was wall-to-wall -wall windows, save for a little employee break room on the far side, which was also empty. When it seemed that they were finally out of danger, he collapsed to the floor, laying on his back, the adrenaline flowing out of him like a waterfall. Holy fuck, that was a lot of stairs, he groaned. Never been so glad in my life to have never skipped a leg day. Candace nodded, catching her breath and wanting to save it by not talking. Matt walked out to the balcony and swallowed hard. Guys, he said over his shoulder, voice somber, I think you need to see this. Brandon groaned as he sat up, and Candace took his hand to help him to his feet so they could wander out to look. The campus was a nightmare. Hundreds of zombies roamed the grounds, feasting and groaning. Smoke rose from various buildings. The I-35 in the distance was bumper to bumper with cars, but none of them were running, only the corpses banging back and forth in between them like rats in a maze. Well, good to see that even in the apocalypse that I-35 traffic doesn't change, Brandon choked and lowered himself to the ground again. He leaned against the sliding door closing his eyes momentarily before staring upwards, instead at the peaceful-looking blue sky. Matt wrapped an arm around his girlfriend's waist and looked down at the exhausted officer. So, what do we do now? Y'all get comfortable, Brandon replied. I'll keep first watch for a chopper. With any luck, there'll be some coming through at some point. The young couple headed back inside, and he resumed staring at the clouds. He watched the lazy, puffy formations and pretended that the ground wasn't covered in the end of the world. Chapter 11 3 p.m. Brandon stood at the edge of the balcony, leaning his head on his arms on the railing, staring in the general direction of the I-35. There was a beer truck standing proudly taller than the rest of the cars, the side reflecting the afternoon sun brilliantly. I know Austin is notorious for their rush hour, but this is pushing it just a bit, don't you think? Candace joked from the doorway and approached slowly. I was just contemplating how difficult of a run it would be to get over to that truck, he replied, pushing up so he was standing straight. We've had a long day and I think we've earned a cold beer, don't you? The blonde trilled a laugh. I'm mostly a tequila girl but you wouldn't get any complaints out of me. Hmm, Brandon replied, eyeing her with interest. That's funny. You didn't strike me as a tequila girl. I grew up with Mexican neighbors who had cookouts just about every weekend, she explained. They were nice enough to invite us over every time. Wait a second. He blinked down at her and then narrowed his eyes. Are you even old enough to drink? She batted her eyelashes at him innocently. Why, yes, officer. Of course I'm old enough to drink, and I would never, ever lie about it. They shared a laugh, and it almost felt normal. Laughing in the sunlight on a balcony. Hey, what's so funny? Matt asked, emerging from inside as he stretched his arms high above his head. Oh, just caught your girl here lying to a uniformed officer, that's all. Brandon teased. She shrugged. Only time in my life I'm going to be able to get away with it, so might as well take advantage, right? Can't fault you for it, he admitted. Matt chuckled and handed out two bottles of water that he'd found in the break room. Candace immediately cracked hers and chugged half of it, moaning with the feel of the liquid on her parched throat. Thanks, Brandon said, and took a few quick sips. How are the supplies looking? Surprisingly good, the young man replied. Looks like they had a catered party recently, so there are a few bins of leftovers in the fridge, not to mention that cooler of bottled water. The officer let out a deep sigh of relief. Well, it's about time something went our way. How's it looking out there? Matt asked, leaning on the railing. Any helicopters? Signs of rescue? Brandon shook his head, trying to hide the disappointment in his gaze. Saw a couple take off an hour ago flying west, he said, motioning vaguely. But they didn't get anywhere close enough for me to signal them. 
Well, man, why don't you go chill out for a bit? The young man suggested. Candace and I will keep watch. You sure? The officer replied. Yeah, Shelton, go take a breather, Candace assured him. As Brandon approached the door, the pounding on the door was more audible, and he shook his head. Those fuckers don't give up, do they? It's been getting a little quieter, Matt said. But yeah, they're still at it. The older man shook his head and headed inside, glancing over his shoulder once more to smile sadly at the young couple, embracing on the balcony. He wished it were under different circumstances, but he was glad that they were getting a moment of peace together. He took a deep breath and let it out very slowly, like his wife did when she practiced yoga. His heart clenched painfully. Chapter 12 6 p.m. Thick black smoke covered most of the Austin skyline in the evening sun. Fires raged out of control, swallowing buildings with no regard for the living or the dead. Brandon ran his hands through his hair. He had no fucking idea where they were going to go from here. If there hadn't been a rescue yet, there wouldn't be one in the dark. How long was it going to be? Would there even be one? Had this thing happened in multiple locations, and the whole country, or even the whole world, had descended into this, leaving nobody to do any rescuing? How are we looking, big guy? Matt asked quietly, approaching him. Brandon shrugged. Same as before, just with about twenty percent more smoke. Another fire? The young man furrowed his brow, leaning against the railing next to him. One of the condo high-rises on the west end, the officer explained pointing to the general area that was now hidden in smog. Started going up about an hour ago. Candace found a butane grill, Matt said, forcing cheerfulness into his voice. She's doing her best to heat us up some dinner. That's mighty nice of her, Brandon replied sincerely. The young man clasped his hands in front of him, eyes downcast. Hey, Shelton, can you level with me? He raised his gaze to fix on the side of the officer's face. Do we have any chance of getting out of this alive? There was an awkward silence in which neither of them even took a breath. The older man hadn't wanted to say it, hadn't wanted to think about it. Otherwise, he could keep pretending it wasn't real. Brandon shook his head. No, we don't really have much of a chance of walking away from this, he said quietly, and then paused. Well, I take that back. We do have a chance. If this is as bad as it looks, and given that half of downtown is currently on fire, it leads me to believe that it is, then the military might get involved. So yeah, it's pretty grim, but don't give up hope just yet. Thanks for being honest with me, Matt replied, picking at a loose thread on the sleeve of his shirt. Just, can you do me a favor? His older companion raised an eyebrow. What's that? If Candace asks, can you give her the more positive version about the military coming to our rescue? Matt avoided his gaze, cheeks flushing a bit with having to ask for dishonesty. I know she's a strong girl and all. Brandon snorted. That's an understatement. You ain't kidding, Matt confirmed. But I just... I don't want to cause her any do worry. Her hearing what you just told me isn't going to change our situation, so I'd rather spare her if I can. He sighed. Does that make sense? He turned his eyes helplessly on his companion. It does... Brandon replied gently. Besides, it'll be nice to know that at least one of us will get to sleep soundly tonight. As if on cue, Candace opened the balcony door and headed over to them. Speak of the devil, Brandon teased. She smirked. You boys talking about me? Yeah, your boyfriend was just telling me what a wonderful cook you are, Brandon told her. Well, I am. She breathed on her nails and then pretended to polish them on her shirt. But let's get one thing straight, fellas. Only reason I cooked tonight was because I knew that if I didn't set that kitchen up just right, you boys would fuck it up. So tomorrow, one of y'all is fixing breakfast. I'm not going to be doing this housewife bullshit all the time. The two men chuckled and nodded like bobbleheads. Good, she replied with an indignant rise of her chin. Now that we're in agreement, come inside and get yourself something to eat. They filed inside, sitting by the windows to keep watch as they ate. At least we have some nice dinner music, Matt joked, inclining his head to the freestyle drumming of zombie hands on the door. 
Chapter 13 Midnight Brandon listened at the stairwell door, the banging having stopped but the shuffles and echoes of groans still audible on the other side. He sighed and grabbed a bottle of water from the cooler, stepping gingerly around the two lovers curled around each other on the floor, sleeping. He slipped outside, closing the sliding door softly behind him. He cracked open the bottle and took a deep draft, leaning on the railing as he watched the city he grew up in burn to the ground. Several more high-rises were engulfed in flames. He didn't know if the zombies had caused mayhem and accidents, or if people had set the buildings on fire on purpose to kill as many creatures as they could. Either way, it illuminated the sky in an eerie amber glow. He was thankful that at least there weren't any big ones near campus, so the flames weren't an immediate threat to them. He couldn't help but feel like it was an almost beautiful sight. While the flames were pretty, the horror of what they were consuming, that was not. Brandon reached into his pocket and slid out his wallet. For the first time that day, he allowed himself to pull out the little family photo from the insert. By moonlight, he gazed down at the faces of the two women that meant the most to him in the whole world. I'm so sorry, he whispered, the words coming out hoarse, his throat thick. I should have been there to protect you, but I wasn't. I hope you were able to get out of the city. I hope that you're alive, and well, and safe. A tear dropped from his nose onto the photo, and he wiped it away with his thumb. His stomach sank at the thought that this was likely the closest he would ever be to them again. I'm going to see you both soon, he whispered, and leaned down, kissing the photo twice before returning it to his wallet. Chapter 14 6 A.M. The trio of survivors startled awake at the sound of a massive rumble outside. The building shook with the force of it, and they all sat up, instantly wide-eyed and awake. Shelton, what was— Matt began, but Brandon put up a hand to silence him. Another loud boom cracked in the distance, followed by the windows rattling in their frames. A metal scream echoed and zoomed by them, and Candace darted over to the window. Look, over there! She pressed her hands against the glass staring at the fighter jet in the morning sun that looped around to head back towards the city. Shelton, you were right. The military is coming to get us. She jumped up and down and turned to Matt, who pulled her into a tight hug. Brandon's lips were set in a thin line as he approached the window to stand next to him, scanning the skyline. There was a west side high-rise that had been on fire the night before. That was completely gone. There was no way that it had burned up that fast. He closed his eyes at the stark realization of what the military was doing. When he opened them again, Matt stared at him over Candace's shoulder, his expression questioning. Brandon simply nodded, confirming the men's fears. They stood and watched helplessly as the jet did another pass of downtown, followed by another hellish explosion that sent flames a hundred feet into the air. Shelton? Candace recoiled from the sight, pushing away from Matt as her face drained of color. What? What are they doing? Brandon took a deep breath. They're doing the only thing they can do. Her hands rose to her mouth, and she stifled a sob. Matt reached out and enveloped her in another tight hug, stroking her blonde hair gently. I'm sorry I couldn't get you all out, Brandon whispered hoarsely. Matt shook his head. You tried, man. That's all we could ask. The two youngsters opened up their hug and extended their arms to the SWAT officer that had risked life and limb to rescue them. He stepped forward and allowed the embrace, taking what little comfort he could that at least the three of them weren't alone. More jets joined the first, and the explosions were closer this time, the windows shaking more, nearly toppling the trio over onto the floor. Things were bright too bright, and they squeezed their eyes shut, tightening their embrace with each blast. Three survivors. Survivors no more. The End